So in today's class, what we're going to do is we'll look at attack trees again. Uh, this time we're going to do a really big attack tree. So last time we looked at the parking garage example, it was kind of a toy example. Now we're going to the other extreme where we're, we're going to do a very thorough attack tree that will actually take us a couple lectures to get through. Um, I like this because A, it will sure, sort of show you the depth that you can go uh, for an attack tree. Uh, it's about an example that's interesting and something you should know about in terms of security. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are the main things. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an attack tree on something called HTTPS. If you don't know what that is, you will after three lectures on it. And it's going to be a, a, a detailed example. OK, so what's HTTPS? So HTTPS is a network protocol. Uh, specifically, it's for transporting hypertext documents. So think just web pages. Okay? Uh, so how does a web page get to you? Uh, it gets to you over something called HTTP. Okay? Uh, and there's a secure version of HTTP that adds some cryptography to the channel to try and protect it. Okay, so HTTPS you can think of as HTTP over SSL slash TLS. Okay, so HTTP is the protocol for requesting web files. So things like HTML files, JavaScript, uh, layouts for web pages, that kind of thing. Okay. SSL TLS is a secure. So it's, I'll just define uh, TLS is uh, uh, transport layer security. And transport layer security uh, is basically it's like crypto cryptography. For a secure channel. And we'll be a little more specific. We'll actually get very, very detailed uh, when uh, as we go into the details. OK, how do you know that you're using HTTPS? So this is something that you actually use. Like, say you go to Google, you might use HTTPS. OK. If you go to Google, do you use HTTPS? Yeah. Okay, so let's try it. So I'll type in whatever, google.com. All right, so here's Google. Did it come over HTTPS? How do you know? Okay, so I'm not showing it to you, but let's go up here. Okay, so two things. One is you see HTTPS colon slash slash. Okay, so yes, it did come over HTTPS. Uh, the other thing you see, uh, beside it is this lock icon. Okay, so that lock icon, when you see it, that signifies that HTTPS is in effect. It actually signifies a little bit more, and we'll go through the details of um, actually this whole attack tree. The next two, three lectures are basically how does a browser decide whether to show that lock or not? It's really what it all boils down to, and it turns out that that's actually an immensely complicated procedure that happens behind the scenes. And it's not just a technical procedure. That's why I like this for attack trees, is it's not just about cryptography and computers talking to computers. It involves humans. It involves computers. It involves companies. Uh, you know, and there's ways of defeating it that involve social engineering, that you know, involve hacking, that involve uh, tricking users and playing on the fact that users don't understand technology uh, maybe to the level that, that uh, we expect them to, okay? Um, so the attack tree at the very end will actually be a really broad uh, sort of set of attacks that touch on all sorts of different things that are both technical and non-technical. How governments can intervene to get that lock shown uh, when it shouldn't be shown, right? So it sounds like kind of crazy, and if you don't know where that lock comes from, uh, anyways, it, it, hopefully it will be an interesting example in addition to showing off how an attack tree might work. Okay, so just, I'll give you some history. It's not really that important. Uh, first off, why is it SSL slash TLS? So that's just for historical reasons. Um, so 
SSL was invented by Nes Netscape. Or there was a protocol, it was called SSL. It was invented by Netscape. Does anyone remember who Netscape was? Okay. It's like one of those old school browsers. Uh, you probably never used it. Um, it eventually became Mozilla. And so Firefox is kind of a descendant of Netscape, not a direct one. But back in the day, Netscape was the very first web browser. Then Microsoft added Internet Explorer to Windows. Those were the two browsers. Uh, and then eventually more people came out with browsers. And then Netscape kind of died. Um, but anyway, they were a big player in the internet back in, uh, so I forget when it was standardized. I want to say 94. I hope I have that date written down. I'll just put the 90s. Uh, and you can fill in the actual date. Okay, when it came out, uh, Netscape had some internal protocol that they were like trying to validate, which was SSL 1.0. And then I don't know what happened to 1.0, but but anyways, when they decided that they had standardized it enough to actually put it in their browser, it was called SSL 2.0. Okay, then sometime later, uh, SSL 3.0 came out. Uh, then what happened is Netscape's a private company. And so a lot of the internet standardization, they decided that we should actually have like a non-commercial, non-company uh, sort of body or someone that's going to oversee this. Uh, so there was a task force created called the IETF and they started standardizing a whole bunch of things. And so they took over the project. Uh, they decided to rename it. Uh, so then it became known as TLS. Uh, the first version of TLS is TLS 1.0. Then there's a TLS 1.1. There's a TLS 1.2. And so TLS 1.2 was the most recent version until like literally this month. Uh, people have been talking about TLS 1.3 and my understanding is that it's now actually released or it's standardized or it, it left the, the one kind of track in the standards committee and it's now like sort of official or whatever. Um, so anyway, so, so this is like as of today and uh, you might not see 1.3 deployed a lot, but uh, hopefully most of the modern web should be here. It's not, that's going to be a problem, but that's a problem for our attack tree. So web should be here. Okay. Um, yeah, and the differences between these don't matter so much. Well, I'll point out a few differences. This isn't a crypto course. So I'm not going to actually show you the cryptography of how it works. Uh, there were flaws. Um, and so SSL 3.0, for example, is completely insecure. Uh, TLS 1.0 could be secure in certain threat models. It's not secure in other threat models. Uh, 1.2 is fine. Uh, there's, I, as far as I know, there's no like very serious vulnerabilities. Sometimes there's vulnerabilities in how it's implemented. Um, but the protocol itself is pretty is pretty good. And then 1.3 kind of cleans it up and they start doing, they start applying a lot of science of cryptography to the protocol to make sure that it's actually secure in a provable sense, mathematical sense. Okay, so HTTPS looks like this. So the indicator is a lock icon. The other indicator could be uh, HTTPS as a descriptor. Technically, they mean slightly different things. Um, so if you have a lock, it did come over HTTPS. It could come over HTTPS and your browser might choose not to show you the lock. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the like corner cases where that might be the case. But for now, just think of them as sort of interchangeable indicators to the user that HTTPS is being used. OK. Now, the next thing that is sort of tedious to go through, but it actually ends up being very important when you want to think about security is, how do you end up on an HTTPS page in the first place? 
okay? So what you saw me do is you saw me type in google.com, okay? So that was my input to the browser. The end result at the very end was I ended up on HTTPS google.com, okay? But how, how is it that I ended up on HTTPS, okay? And so it turns out that there's a couple different ways that it might happen, and they become relevant if you wanna try and disrupt. So eventually we're gonna think about the security of this, and one attack is we're gonna try and disrupt the person's, uh, a user's ability to actually get on HTTPS in the first place. And so it's worth splitting out uh, how you end up on an HTTPS page, okay? And so in terms of broad categories, we can think of uh, there's an indirect way and there's a direct way that you might end up. Okay, so the indirect way, which is exactly what happened, probably, actually, I'll, I'll talk through a few things that might have happened behind the scenes. Um, can't spell today, um, is what happened is it probably actually sent me to HTTP Google dot com first. Google said, actually, I talk over SSL. I'm going to redirect you. And there's a couple of different ways that you can set up redirects, and we don't have to go through all the difference. OK, uh, but the point is that I first went to HTTP Google and then Google switched me over to HTTPS. OK, um, so I was redirected. So I'll put user. goes to HTTP and is redirected to HTTPS. Okay. And from a security perspective, if we can stop this redirection from happening, then we could defeat the security. We haven't really talked about what you get from HTTPS, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. Um, now, browsers are smart. And so browsers by now know that Google is over HTTPS. And so when I typed in google.com, Safari probably figured out it was Google and it should be just taking me straight to HTTPS. It shouldn't bother with HTTP. And there's ways of you telling the browser that you should always be accessed over HTTPS. Don't let the user even try to access me over HTTP. That's called pinning, something we'll talk about uh, in a bit, okay? Um, so that's an indirect way. Um, the direct way that you might end up, in other words, you don't go to HTTPS first and then end up to HTTPS, you just go straight to HTTPS, is either the user just types in HTTPS, so that's always an option. So from a security perspective, if you know you have some reason in your mind that you want to go to the HTTPS one, you can just type in HTTPS colon slash slash and then the the name of the domain, and you will go to the HTTPS version. If there is no HTTPS version, then you'll, you'll get some sort of error. Um, so you can type this in directly, but most of us just type in google.com. We don't bother with the whole prefix. Uh, the user might have like a bookmark. And so if the bookmark is to the HTTPS version, then every time you click on it, uh, you will go to it. Or the other option is that the user follows a link. And the link is to the HTTPS version. Okay, so you go to my website and you click on something that's taking to another domain. When I coded my website, I put it on HTTPS. Okay, or I put that link, I put in HTTPS for that link. And then that will redirect you to the HTTPS version. Okay, um, so the most common example of this, the one that matters the most is search engines. So a lot of us, find stuff through search engines, right? And so if your browser knows that, let's say you use Google as your search engine, if your browser knows that Google always is over HTTPS, then your search itself will happen over HTTPS, and then Google will link you to HTTPS pages if it knows that HTTPS pages exist, and you'll kind of like never leave HTTPS, okay? So that's a very common flow that people will follow, and so making sure that that flow is as secure as possible is, is important. 
Um, but anyway, so search engines are important here. How does like Google, for example, figure out whether they should link you to the HTTPS version or the HTTP version, assuming that both exist? Uh, yeah, so it doesn't base it on the certificates, but it's a good guess. So, okay, so it might just default always to HTTPS. So, for example, I'll give you a concrete example of this. Um, uh, Wikipedia used to have both HTTP and HTTPS. And Google actually always linked to HTTP, even though HTTPS was there and Google knew that it was there, it really actually came down to more of a human decision. They sort of knew that Wikipedia is this high volume site. They weren't explicitly sort of telling Google you should always link to HTTPS. And so they thought we would play it safe because there is a slight computational overhead to doing things because you have to set up the cryptography. Although it turns out that that's very, very marginal. It might not even exist at all uh, because with modern HTTPS, you can do other things that will, will save you efficiency as well as um, as well as um, as well as the overhead of it so it might be a net negative but anyways the point is they didn't want to switch over automatically and so it was really kind of like a human software engineer at Google kind of perspective they would look for cues from the website so if the website uh, advertised in a protocol kind of way a sort of indication or a preference for HTTPS so there's certain uh, things that they can set, headers and things like that that they can set, then they would they would sort of use that as a guide. Uh, but a lot of this was just kind of at the human level. It wasn't at a, a sort of protocol level. Now, Wikipedia eventually realized that uh, they really need to switch over to HTTPS uh, for privacy reasons. And so they uh, did switch. We'll talk about how effective HTTPS is in that specific case. But um, anyways, uh, so, so there's a lot of human discretion that's involved in this uh, kind of decision. Okay, so what does it actually do? Okay, so this is some sort of security protocol. It gives you crypto. Crypto is awesome, right? Uh, what, like, what is it? What exactly does it actually do? So let's say that we have here's Alice, here's Google, or whoever. I should stop using Google. I'll just use domain. Um, okay, so we have a server. They're at domains.ca. We have a user. Her name's Alice. Uh, she could talk HTTP to the domain, or she could talk HTTPS. If she talks HTTPS, what, what's the deal with that? Like, why, why is that better? What does it mean to be better? It's going to be a secure channel, a secure channel between Alice and the domain. So every information that is sent from Alice to the domain, nobody can eavesdrop. Even if they eavesdrop, it's not going to be anything meaningful. Okay. okay. All right. So. The idea of a secure channel or secure tunnel is a really nice analogy. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll use that as our operating analogy. So we have this kind of, you can think of it as a tunnel. And let's say that we have someone that's in the middle. Okay, uh, call them Eve. We'll give them devil horns because they're bad. Okay, and so the idea is that Eve here, um, should not be able to see what's actually being sent over the tunnel. Okay, and what does that mean? Like, like she doesn't see that there's anything there. Uh, so in this case, what we're doing is we're using encryption. So she does see that there's data that's flowing. It's just kind of scrambled up. Okay, so she can't read what that data is. Okay, so we call this uh, message confidentiality. So this is what a secure tunnel means. Message just means the thing that's being sent. Um, you can think of it as data or whatever you want.
Okay, so no party on the path can read the traffic. Okay, who could a party on the path be? So let's say this is Alice and she's going to Google. Let's say Alice is in this room, right? She's sitting at this laptop. She types in google.com. Who, who's in the middle? Okay. Okay, okay. So let's think of very concrete here. So I'm at Concordia, right? Uh, so first my packet's going to go from this computer because it's on Wi-Fi, it's going to go to some router that's probably in this room. Okay, so that router is in the middle. It could know where I'm going. Okay, um, then it will go from that router to like the the sort of gateway of Concordia. There might be some middle pieces, but anyway, the point is that Concordia is you know IITS or AITS. They are in the middle. Okay, so they can read traffic. Now, if there's HTTPS, the, it will be encrypted, so they can't read it. Uh, but if it was unencrypted HTTP traffic, they were in the middle, so they could read it. Okay. Uh, then it will go from Concordia to Concordia's ISP. So that's the person that Concordia is paying for access to the internet. Uh, I forget who that is in Concordia's case. Then it will go kind of in the backbone, what we call the backbone of the internet. So these are like big data companies, like Bell would own a bunch of infrastructure in Canada, and there would be other companies, and it will get routed. Uh, and then uh, who knows, maybe it ends up in governments like back closet somewhere and the government's looking at it, the Canadian government or the US government. Uh, then it goes uh, towards Google. And so Google will, they're probably their own ISP, but let's assume that maybe they have an ISP. Uh, so it would go to their ISP and then it would eventually end up at their servers, okay? And so the idea of the secure tunnel is that uh, any of those people there in the middle, ISPs, the companies, the infrastructure that you're using, the router, um, yeah, yeah, they're all like sort of uh, people in the middle. Okay, so we used to call them men in the middle, we'll call them people in the middle. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, so this is what SSL does. Does it do anything else for you? Okay, so there's, what, what's integrity? So, um, nobody can change, uh, or nobody assuming can that they can Nobody can alter the message. Okay, okay, so there's a slight difference here between can I read the message and can I change it, okay? And you might say, well, if you can't read it, how can you change it? But it turns out, and if you take 6110, a cryptography course, you'll learn that you can actually change data even if you can't read it. So for example, if there's some number going by and you have no idea what that number is, but you wanna double it, you can like kind of mathematically manipulate it so that when the person decrypts it, it will be twice as big as the original message and you still don't know what that message was. Okay, so in cryptography, you can manipulate uh, messages. Conversely, you might say, well, let's say there was no confidentiality. Integrity is still pretty important. Uh, even if Eve could read it, uh, Alice wants to know that, um, for example, let's say she's downloading software, okay? And so it's not, like, it's not like secret software, it's open source software or something like that. So keeping it secret, that's not really that important. But what Alice is really concerned of is the, piece of software that she downloads is exactly the same as what the web server served up, okay? In other words, there wasn't someone in the middle that replaced that piece of software with a new piece of software that kind of does the same thing but has a backdoor in it or it has malware in it or something like that, okay? So if you download software over HTTP, somebody in the middle could actually replace that software with a new version of software, and we've seen this, this isn't a theoretical attack, and then uh, you have actually no idea, you have no guarantee whether that is real or not. Now there's other things like code signing that, that also kind of try and solve this problem. But anyways, using HTTPS basically gives you the guarantee that the message received is exactly as it was sent. If Eve goes in and modifies it, it's not a prevention mechanism, so Eve can modify it. There's nothing stopping her. She can go in and flip those bits. But basically, when you receive it, you'll do some computations on it to see if it's changed, and you'll notice, you'll detect that it's been changed, and then it will just throw an error and say, you know, this data was corrupted, and then it will try and get it again, okay? Um, so that's, that's concretely how it works. So we'll put this as message integrity.
Okay. So a lot of times we think of SSL as being <coughs> confidentiality. A lot of times we actually think of all of cryptography as being about confidentiality. It's true. Encryption, which is one big part of cryptography, <coughs> is, about, uh, is about confidentiality. But integrity is actually really important too. And so there's lots of cryptography like Max and hash functions and signatures and things like that that are devoted to uh, trying to provide some sort of message integrity. Okay, anything else? Okay. Okay, okay, so that's right. So there's something here, there's a third property that it does that's in and around this idea of authentication. So let me pitch it this way, slightly different. Alice here, she knows she has a secure tunnel. She can see it. She can see that she's dropping her messages in a secure tunnel. And she knows that as long as those messages are in that secure tunnel, nobody can read them and nobody can modify them. Okay, so that sounds like a pretty complete description of what you'd want from a secure ch channel, but there's one big problem. How does she know where the tunnel ends, right? If that tunnel ends at the router, right? She sees, oh, I'm dropping my messages in this secure tunnel, and it's true, they are secure until they hit the router, but then, they, then the tunnel's over. Right, then everybody from the router on can intercept all the messages, okay? So a secure tunnel is absolutely 100% useless if you have no guarantee of where it ends. If you can't establish where the tunnel ends, then I shouldn't say it's 100% useless. I mean, it's, it's arguably better than nothing, but it's really like marginally better than nothing, right? Um, and so if you don't have any guarantee where the tunnel ends, then yeah, you are dropping your messages in a secure tunnel, but they could be decrypted before it even leaves your computer, right? Uh, so what you want is you wanna know where does the tunnel end, okay? Does that tunnel actually end at Google or the domain.ca or is it ending somewhere in the middle, right? Maybe Eve, instead of trying to read your tunnel or trying to modify the message in the tunnel, she's trying to end the tunnel so she's sort of in the middle and she sees you trying to set up this tunnel and she tries to get it to end at her, right? And so if she can get it to end at her then uh, it's because she's at the end point of the tunnel, then she can read and modify all of your messages, right? She could even form another tunnel from her to the actual domain and just sit in the middle. And so for that split second while she's in the middle, everything kind of leaves one tunnel and then hops into another tunnel and she can do all her modifications in the middle, okay? So secure tunnels, where they end is really important. Uh, identifying the end party we call authentication. So authentication, and because it's usually a server, we think in terms of servers, it's not necessarily a server. We'll call it server authentication, okay? So server authentication is that where does the tunnel end problem. It could also end somewhere completely different. Like you might be thinking you're sending it here and it's really going over to the adversary who's not even on the path. They're just like in a completely different, uh, along a different path. Um, Okay, so I'm on Google, I have the lock. So I have a secure tunnel. So my whatever search term I type in here, Montreal Impact, um, that I drop that into a secure tunnel. So it went somewhere in a secure tunnel. 
did that actually go to Google, all the way to Google in the secure tunnel? How do, how do I know that my tunnel ended at Google? Okay, so there's a certificate. What's a certificate? It's a public key. Okay, so if I click on the lock, there's this certificate thing. So there's a bunch of numbers and stuff like that. So this means that it ended at Google? Yeah, so Google was signed by Google. That's what this is telling me. By Global Sign? Yeah, and so Google was then signed by Global Sign. It actually turns out that if whoever signed this is authoritative over everything, but yeah. But anyways, it's signed. So what? It, so it's that Global Sign somehow figured out that my search term ended up at Google. Did I like go? Hey, Global Sign, I'm sending, no. I'm sending stuff here. Are you sure that this is where the tunnel ends? Can you set up that tunnel for me? Yeah. Isn't the, the certificate just to guide the client hello protocol uh, initiation to the Google like so it. Because in the protocol, there's going to be exchange of public key and private key, and there's going to be computation between them. So with this certificate, uh, an adversary in the middle cannot impersonate Google. OK, so because what you're saying is sort of right. It's not directly answering the question of how do I know that this is Google. But it's true that the certificate is used in this protocol that goes back and forth. It is true that certificate authorities are very important. It's true that global sign plays an important role here. It's true that Google plays an important role here, but no one's answered the core question. And I don't actually expect you to. So at this point, think just think about what you think the answer is. Do you have a certificate of Google, like a um, public certificate? Yeah. And Google is using a certificate that is signed by Google. Yeah. So you know like Google is authenticating you, that is Google. Global is authenticating you, that's Google. OK. How do I know that global is global? Because you have its public key on your machine from the beginning. Trust. OK. Browser. OK. So there is some trust that's baked into a computer. There is this sort of chain of trust. Um, and so anyway, so everyone's sort of saying right things. Uh, but we need to piece this together. It's, it's, all I'll say is it's a little more complicated than everyone's seen. So we'll, one of the things we'll do is we'll walk through and we'll really understand what exactly is it? You know, what, what is a certificate? What does it mean to be issued? What does it mean to be signed? If you have a certificate, why is that better than not having a certificate? All of these issues will piece together. Um, yeah. Uh, I think um, we have to know the certification authority first, who are giving an SSL-SPSL certificate, and who are verifying after an audit. Um, if we have knowledge about uh, these certificate issuing authorities, so we can say, yes, it is also authorizing this website, so we can browse through. Sure, sure, sure. So certificate authorities do vouch for the identities of websites. So that's important. The, the main piece that's missing is how. Like, what exactly does that look like, right? Right. So how is it that I learned to trust GlobalSign? How is it that GlobalSign learned who Google was, right? How is it that my search term knows that that goes to Google that was signed by Global Trust? So it's true. There is, there is these entities. They are sitting in the middle. They are providing trust. But we, we'll piece together exactly what, what that trust assumption is. Okay? So we'll be very, very specific about it. So if you know it, you might know it from another course. But anyways, if you don't know, think about how you would do it. And then as we go through, you can start to, you'll understand it better if you have a guess as to how you think it will work, even if it turns out to work a little bit different. OK, so now what we want to do is we want to do an attack tree. OK? And so remember, an attack tree is one specific attack on one specific system. And so I said I'll do the example of HTTPS. So this is going to be an attack tree about HTTPS. But you can't do an attack tree about all of the attacks on HTTPS uh, because attack trees are specific to one specific attack. Okay? So there's a lot of different ways that you might break the properties of HTTPS. But we're going to just concentrate on one. Okay, so we're going to attack a tree of one specific attack on HTTPS, but it's going to be a very generic, kind of vague uh, sounding attack. Okay.
So this is the attack tree. You can do it on different things, but this is the one that I chose uh, that, that I think is interesting. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to think about all the ways that we can break the confidentiality property. Okay, so we won't worry about integrity. We will worry about server authentication, but because it's an indirect way of breaking confidentiality. Okay, so we'll only care about that in an indirect sense. Not We're not directly, that's not the end goal. Okay, so the end goal, um, and the best way to do attack tree is actually to have your center node just be explicitly a goal. What's the adversary's goal? And so the adversary's goal I'm going to phrase as observe traffic sent over HTTPS. And in order to just kind of make it easier, the point of HTTPS is if it when it works, you don't care who's in the middle. Right? You're happy to route your traffic through someone you don't trust at all, right? Because HTTPS is going to protect you. Okay? So if it works, you don't you don't actually care about who you're routing it through. Okay? And so what we're going to do is just to sort of clarify the attack is we're going to assume that somehow you as the attacker have already got yourself in the middle of this connection. Okay? We won't spend time about thinking about how you might do that. Maybe you're running malware on the machine. Maybe you own the Wi-Fi router. Maybe you're an ISP. Maybe you're a government. Uh, I don't know. I don't care how. But once you're in that position, you're on the wire, we're going to do a tax tree of how do you then break the confidentiality property. Okay? Uh, so what we'll do is we'll lock it down to be from a man in the middle position. All right, so this stands for a man in the middle. It is sexist, but it's the most common term. I'll just abbreviate. Okay, um, so what we'll do is, um, for this attack tree, it's going to get kind of big. Uh, so instead of drawing it by hand, it will be too messy. Uh, you can use software. So uh, some software that I like, you don't have to use this, but there's a generic kind of class of software called mind mapping. It's actually really good for organizing your thoughts about anything. Um, but uh, it's it's good at doing attack trees. Uh, it allows you to kind of drag and drop and move things around as need be. Uh, so this is one, it's called mind map. Uh, it lets you save to Google Drive, that's why I use it. Um, so I'm gonna put in the root node as uh, the goal. Okay, so observe traffic sent over HTTPS from a man in the middle position. Okay, and then you can make you know nodes and have sub nodes and that kind of stuff. Okay, and it's very easy, and you can kind of drag stuff around and uh, rearrange your thoughts. Okay. All right. So just to get the attack tree started, this is something that if I just said that's the attack go um you know it's hard to kind of conceptualize what the problems will will look like so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start penciling in general categories of attacks and then i'll try and make it interactive and, and we'll try and think through uh what these attacks might look like but what i'm going to do is i'll give you three basic strategies and most of the attacks fit or all the ones that we'll talk about anyways will fit into one of these three strategies. So here we have Alice. We have our secure tunnel. We have the server. And we have the adversary. Us. In the middle already and uh, trying to achieve our goal. Okay. And so uh, these are the three things that, that you could do. The first thing is you can try and break the tunnel itself. So you can try and break the, in particular, the confidentiality protections of the tunnel. Okay, uh, all the attacks in this category are cryptographic in nature. I don't assume any of you, some of you I know have taken 
uh, have taken, sorry, 6110. Even if you've taken 6110, explaining how the attacks work are kind of, they're even beyond like, kind of the scope of that course. Like we could shortcut a bunch of the details, but it would still take a long time to explain actually how they work because they tend to be pretty involved. So I'm going to give you for the completeness of this chart, I'll give you a bunch of attacks. I don't expect you to understand them. I'm not going to test you on an exam about the details of them. Uh, I'm just going to sort of give you some general categories of, of what they are just so that you you can start thinking so that you realize that this is actually a real way that you could attack this protocol. Okay, uh, they're very technical. So these are, are sort of your technical set of uh, attacks. The second thing you could do is you could say, I can't break the tunnel. And so, so what? So one thing we might say is, well, I am in the middle. And as I said, you see scrambled information that's going back and forth. So you see the flow, you just can't read it. Well, maybe you could still do something with that. Like it's not, you know, maybe maybe there's something you could infer. So maybe you just, you do exactly what the protocol allows you to do, which is just sit in the metal and sort of inspect the tunnel from the outside. And maybe that's good enough. Like, how do we know that this tunnel actually does its job of creating confidential data flows uh, between the two parties, okay? So let's think about what we could do if we just, just do what the protocol allows us to do, which is, um, inspect traffic from outside the tunnel so we don't try to break it. Okay, and then the last thing we're going to do is the attack that I alluded to, which is uh, what really matters is where's the tunnel pointed at. Okay, if we can get the tunnel pointed to us then it doesn't matter if it's a secure tunnel or not. That just says it's secure until it hits us. But once it hits us, we're at the end of the tunnel, so it's coming out the other end, then we can actually look at it, okay? Then we can achieve our goal. So that's sufficient to achieve our goal if we can get that tunnel pointed at us, okay? So the third kind of general strategy will be um, get the tunnel pointed at us instead of the server. Ideally without the user knowing, right? So the user just looks in it, you know, they typed in google.com and there's a lock, right? So it must be at google.com, right? But really your traffic is ending somewhere else. Okay, that would be the best case scenario. Uh, there are other compromises that we could make as well uh, to sort of think about this category of the attack. Okay, so like I said, this will be kind of an enumeration of a bunch of crypto attacks that I won't bother to explain. Uh, this will be sort of interesting. Uh, there's, there's not a lot you can do here, but what you can do here is maybe counterintuitive. It's maybe something that you haven't thought about and it's, it's actually a little more powerful. It's, it won't allow you to completely achieve your goal, but you can actually do a lot uh, uh, from the second category. And then the third category is actually where we'll spend most of the time uh, because that whole idea of, of me knowing that my traffic is actually ending at Google, it's actually very involved. There's a lot of moving parts uh, to that equation and there's a lot of opportunity uh, to attack it. And one thing you should always remember from a security perspective is security is always sort of harder. It's easier to attack a system than to defend a system. Because if you have like 50 components that are, and you need all 50 of them to work uh, in order for it to be secure, the attacker just, generally has to break one of them, right? It's kind of like a chain. And so they look and they're like, well, there's 50 points I can't hack. What's the weakest? And if I can break that one component, then I can break that, that sort of whole chain of the system, okay? And so SSL is like, literally there are things called chains, but at a more kind of allegorical level, it is really chaining a bunch of security assumptions altogether. And there's a lot of opportunity where you can just attack some link that's actually not that strong. And you can kind of, it's amazing how you can bring the whole system down just by being able to do like, like somewhat basic things. Um, okay, so this is where we're going. Okay, so we can do these in any order. Uh, since I'm following the notes from last year, I think I took a poll of the class and we decided to actually start with number two before we talk about number one, because number one's kind of boring. Um, so why don't we do that? So we'll, we'll start with number two. I'll walk you through it. For number one, if it 
if it happens that it falls between classes or something like that, maybe I'll just prepare the attacks and then we can just talk through them uh, because they're, they're not that interesting. They won't mean anything to you. They would be very interesting if, if you were in, into cryptography. But two and three, we can, a lot of these concepts we can understand because uh, they're, not, they're not technical concepts, okay? So let's just start with number two. Okay, and then over on the attack tree side, we can we can sort of pencil these things in too. Okay, so we'll call the first one breaking message confidentiality. The third one subverting uh, server authentication. And then the middle will, I'll pencil in as inspect from outside. I'll, I'll look at the exact terminology I used last year and, and I might clean it up a bit. Okay, uh, so let's just do an example. Actually, do you know what? It's maybe a good time for a break because it's sort of a logical break. So why don't we take our break now? Uh, we'll go for 10 minutes and then we'll come back at 7. Okay. So, as mentioned, we will start with 2. So the second property that we'll start with is uh, inspect from the outside the tunnel. Uh, so basically what this is is a passive attack. Passive meaning the adversary is just sitting in the middle and listening. Uh, it's sometimes called eavesdropping. Okay, uh, so let's use an example. Uh, so we'll go back and go to my favorite soccer team, which I spelled wrong. And uh, okay, so let's say I wanna go and read about the Montreal Impact uh, from Wikipedia. Okay, so this is great. Uh, so here I am, I'm on Wikipedia's website uh, for the Montreal Impact. Uh, you can see it is served over HTTPS. Uh, let me just grab a screenshot of that. Okay, so what, let's visualize what's going on when I go and visit this website and then we'll think about what the security implications are uh, for it. Can't grab that. So here's me. Here's the web server. The web server in this case is en.wikipedia.org. And what I'm saying to get this website, to in order to see this actual page, what I did is we'll simplify it, but basically I said get, and then I told it the file that I wanted it to get, okay? And so the file that I wanted to get was slash wiki, slash Montreal Impact. Okay. So if I send this command, get this resource from to the server that controls this domain, then the end result is I get this page as the end result. Okay. So then I get the web page. Okay, now, as mentioned, this is all going over HTTPS. So I'm the adversary and I'm sitting in the middle.
What do I see? What do I see and what don't I see? So let me ask you some questions. Do I see the content of the page that was downloaded? No. Okay, so that's protected. Do I know that uh, Alice is looking at the Montreal Impact article? Okay, so maybe yes, maybe no. If it was yes, why? Okay, so some sort of headers. Okay, uh, let, let me come back to that question. Uh, does she know I'm going to Wikipedia? Does Eve know that uh, Alice is going to Wikipedia? Yeah. Okay, why? Okay, okay, so there's actually two reasons here. So everyone saying DNS is right, uh, so that's one thing that we'll think about. Um, before we get there, there's a much simpler explanation, which is your traffic has to be addressed to a web server, otherwise the, the internet can't route it to the correct server, okay? So the first most important thing to understand is that uh, HTTPS does not protect the domain name of the website that you're visiting. So if you're going to wikipedia.org, even if you're using HTTPS, I know that you're going to wikipedia.org. Everybody on the path knows it's going to wikipedia.org. If they did not know it was going there, then there's no way it could have got there, okay? Uh, there are some roundabout ways that you could know, like if you use something like Tor, which we'll, we will actually talk about at some point in this course. But anyways, just general default out of the box technology. Uh, it needs to know where it's going, uh, so it has to be addressed. Okay, so HTTPS does not protect the domain. Okay, and that's actually very important to realize because there's lots of domains that are maybe illicit uh, and HTTPS isn't going to protect an adversary from knowing that you're going to it. Or let's say that the government is suppressing uh, certain types of information. If they just know the domain of those websites, it doesn't, you can use HTTPS, it's not gonna stop them from blocking those domains because they know uh, what the domains are that you're visiting, okay? So HTTPS doesn't, it's not, there's a certain depth, right? So it, it protects some of the information, but not all of it, okay? So we established that the page that comes back, the content of the page, that seems to be under the covers of HTTPS. Or you can think of it this way, HTTPS, think of it like an envelope. So some of the stuff's in the envelope and some of it's written on the outside of the envelope, okay? So wikipedia.org is written on the outside of the envelope, everyone can see it. The web page itself is inside the envelope. Now let's go back to the other question. What about slash Wikipedia slash Montreal Impact? No. So that can go in the envelope. Okay, so it can, once it gets to n.wikipedia.org or the English version of Wikipedia, then it can open the envelope and it can figure out what page uh, you want to look at. Okay, so there's no reason that the people in the middle have to know what web page you're uh, grabbing it from. Okay, now the other thing that people mentioned is there's also DNS. And so that's something else we have to think about. How is it that we even sent this get request to n.wikipedia.org? How did we learn what n.wikipedia.org is? Well, it turns out that on the internet, servers don't have names, they have numbers, right? They have IP addresses. And so if you have an IP address, the backbone of the internet can figure out how to get your packet where you want it to go. But what you need to do is you need to convert this into uh, into an IP address, okay? And so generally the way that you're going to do that is you're gonna, before you even go here, unless if you've been there recently and you've cached the result, you're gonna ask a completely different server, a server that's generally provided by your ISP. Uh, what's the IP address for en.wikipedia? Dot org. Okay, and then it will reply, oh, it's whatever, whatever it is, 108.3. whatever. I just made that up. I don't know exactly what it is. Okay, does the DNS server know every domain that you're going to? It does. Okay, so the DNS server knows all the domains that you're going to. It doesn't know necessarily the page that you're going to, but that's another thing. Is this, does this go over HTTPS? Okay, um, so this does not go over HTTPS.
Now, I don't want to get into a big discussion of network protocols because it's not really relevant. Um, it turns out that HTTPS is for HTTP. HTTP runs on something called TCP. Uh, we actually referred to TCP earlier, I guess, when we talked about denial of service attacks. TCP is a kind of network connection that you do a handshake first. So you send a message, they send a message back, and then you can start exchanging data, okay? And that makes sure that both parties know who they're talking to, or they, they're both expecting that that connection is opened. And then we mentioned there's another type of protocol called UDP. Uh, with UDP, you just start sending traffic. Uh, you, don't, you don't wait for a response. So it turns out that DNS runs over UDP. There is an HTTPS kind of equivalent uh, for UDP. Um, the name escapes me, but Datagram TLS, DTLS is the crypto suite. I, for, I forget what they call the actual protocol itself. Um, but anyway, so there is this sort of equivalent of TLS that is for UDP. DNS does not use it, okay? Uh, now there is a movement to create something called DNSSEC, uh, which is DNS secure. And what that's going to do is it's not going to add confidentiality. So it's not going to be encrypted messages, but what it will add is integrity. So the records that you get back will be signed or there'll be some sort of cryptographic protection so that when you get that record, you know that that's what was sent. Otherwise, the adversary can just sit in the middle. And this isn't an attack that's, that's directly relevant to what our goal is, but it's another attack that you might want to do. And we'll actually use this attack later in an indirect way. But if an adversary is sitting on your connection to the DNS server, when you ask for wikipedia.org, they can send you somewhere totally different, right? They can send the, you to their own website or something like that, okay? Um, and so that's a, that's a consideration, okay? And ideally, if SSL is working right, even if you get sent to the wrong website, you shouldn't be able to accept a certificate from that website. Like that server authentication should say, hey, you're actually talking to the wrong person, or we don't know that you're talking to the right server. And so it doesn't matter what DNS says. But uh, we have to put a lot of pieces together before we, we do a deep dive on this. But for now, what we'll note is that DNS does indeed uh, learn all the domains. And the person inspecting your traffic also learns uh, at least the domain that you're visiting, if not the page itself. And uh, they might not be able to see the content of the page itself, okay? Um, so the domain is not hidden by HTTPS. And there's some other stuff. So we call this meta information. Uh, so meta is uh, sort of information that's not the, the content of it, sort of the, the stuff that's on the outside of the envelope. And uh, we'll, we'll spend a little time, we'll do a little bit more of a finer grain split down of what's included and what's not included in the tunnel. Uh, but I have to explain like what are the kinds of stuff that goes along with these requests and these responses. Um, so this is a response here, which is the web page. Okay, so one thing we could do just if we want to start working on our attack tree, uh, we could pencil in, um, we can learn at least the domain being visited, either from observing DNS or just directly by observing HTTPS traffic. Okay, and so in some cases, if the domain might be enough, right? That might be all that you're trying to do. You don't care about the traffic, you just know, is this person actually going to this kind of website? And so HTTPS uh, won't, won't protect you. Okay, now let's uh, go back to this diagram. Let me um, grab a copy of it. Okay, so I'm going to simplify it. We don't need all of this detail. So we'll just note that there is some sort of DNS thing happening here. Okay, so I say, give me 
Montreal Impact, right? And what do I actually get as a response? So here I, I really simplified it. I just said, you get the website, right? So you get um, all of this. So all of this comes down with it. What, what is all of this? Let's be a little more specific. Like what, what exactly is coming down the other end? Okay. Okay. So the very first thing I get is uh, this is actually implicitly index.html if there's no actual thing. Um, so in this case, Wikipedia does some like domain mapping things, but um, there is an HTML page that's, that is coming down uh, with this, this website. So that's the first thing I get is I'll get a, an HTML page. Okay. Um, what about this picture? Okay, so there's this logo here. Okay, Does, is that inside the HTML page? Okay, so the that image is not in the HTML file. Okay, what's in the HTML file is a link to that picture. It says, hey, I made a spot in the page layout to plop a picture. Maybe you say what the dimensions of the picture are, and then you say that picture can be found at this URL, okay? So what happens, and you don't notice it because it happens so fast. You actually did notice it, like if you use the internet you know, 20 years ago, uh, but now everything happens so fast that everything looks instant. Uh, but what really happens is you get an HTML file, and then to get that image, what you do is you figure out what the link is to the image, and then you create another uh, request, which is, okay, now I want to get um, that image file. Uh, so let's just see where it's at. I'll just simplify a bit. Uh, so we'll say wiki slash image dot JPEG or something like that. Uh, we'll call it logo. Okay. And uh, where is this image located? Is it on the same server or is it on a different server? Okay. So the answer is we don't know. It could be either. Okay, so there's no, there's nothing that says it has to be on the same server. It could be on the same server. It might be on a different server. It's really up to the website itself. Okay, so you can definitely link to images that are on a totally different server. Okay, so let's say, let's just for the argument, or um, just to make it fun, let's say it's a different, we'll keep it on wikipedia.org, but we'll say it's at like media.wikipedia.org. Okay. Uh, then we get the actual image back. And then what your browser does is it plops this file into this HTML file according to uh, what the HTML file says to do with it. Okay? Um, all right. So what's actually happening is you, you no longer, on the modern web, you don't download a single HTML file and then you're done. What you download is you download kind of like a root file and it links to a bunch of other stuff and then you pull down all the other stuff, okay? So a modern website weaves together content from multiple sources. Okay, so this is great. What does it have to do with HTS, HTTPS? Okay, here's a thought experiment. Let's say that uh, get Wikipedia slash Montreal Impact, that's an HTTPS request. So you download it, uh, the HTML file, and it says, hey, go fetch this image, but this image is being hosted on an HTTP server. Okay, so in other words, your first request goes over, HTTP, it goes over SSL. Uh, HTTPS, and your second request just goes over HTTP. Okay. Uh, first off, is this allowed? Can you do that? Yes. Okay, so it turns out you can. What about the lock? Like, if the first one's happening over HTTPS, then probably going to show the lock, but then there's this image and it's not coming over HTTPS. So I have 
like this website and this website is like kind of weaving together a bunch of content. Some of it's coming to me over HTTPS, some of it's not coming to me over HTTP. Do I say, do I show the lock and say that this page came over HTTPS or do I not show the lock? Okay, okay. So it turns out it's kind of complicated. Uh, so there's a complicated story here. So the browser does, doesn't, it's going to make a decision. So it's going to have a policy about what it's going to show you. And there's going to be a couple different cases. Okay. So in general, if the website, the first request comes over HTTPS, the browser is going to try and show you the lock. Okay. But it's going to decide not to show you the block, the lock, uh, if it sees a couple things. Okay. So to answer the question directly, if you load a website over HTTPS and an image comes over HTTP, it will show you the lock. Okay. But that's not going to be true about everything that you might download. Okay. So an image is going to be different than other things that you might download. So we have to actually care about what, what is the resource that we're loading before we can decide that. So we'll say if the first request is over HTTPS, but uh, follow-up requests for content on the page are not over HTTPS. Does the browser show the lock? And it doesn't really matter whether it shows the lock or not, but we have to think about like what does it mean from a security perspective. Uh, but we'll phrase it in this way. Okay, so the answer is it depends. If you have content that is what's considered passive, so a passive content is basically not code. Okay, so an image or something that you show, um, or maybe another uh, small HTML file, something like that, um, then it will show the lock. I have to rethink this. This is a little convoluted. Let's just say images are the best example of this. So we'll just keep it restricted to image. So let's pause and think. Is there no attack here? Uh, if I go to this Wikipedia article and um, this image comes down over HTTP, right? What does that actually mean from like a practical standpoint? What that means is that image could have been substituted. Okay, so someone could have saw that request for that image. Better yet, they could have saw the image coming back, and they don't know the content of the page that the image is going to be placed in. But they could look at that image and they could say, "Oh, that I know what that is. That's the Montreal Impact logo." And what they could do is they could change it to another image. Okay, so they could change it to Barcelona, right? And is that a big deal? Probably not. So it depends. There might be some specific security re like considerations where you really care about the images and you care that they're they have integrity. But in general, not such a big deal. Okay. So the reason that they choose to show the lock, they're not saying that this this there's no attack here. They're just saying that on balance, you know, a lot of browser decisions they take in a lot of considerations and they just say on balance, you know, it seems okay to show the lock. Okay. So uh, it's kind of in the middle, it's in a gray zone, but uh, it, it seems okay, not that bad to show the lock, okay? Now there's other kinds of stuff that comes down. So when I downloaded this website, I got the HTML page and the HTML page said, go grab this image, grab this image, grab this image. Uh, what are some other stuff that this website grabs that aren't images? Maybe short videos or something. Okay, so it could be some other 
kind of passive content. So videos uh, we'll put in, that's actually a good example of, of something that's passive. So it used to be that you'd use like plugins for videos and things like that, but now with HTML5 you can uh, just directly serve up videos. I'll just say images, media, I'll put videos. Okay, so that will be passive, that will be fine as well. So you can replace uh, this kind of content. What are some other things that, that come down? Okay, so JavaScript's probably the biggest. So you download JavaScript, and what JavaScript is, is it's code. It comes from the server, and then it runs on your browser. Okay, it runs in the browser, and it lets you do something uh, within the browser where you don't have to communicate uh, back to the website, okay? Um, so for example, if I click this little show thing, is that really going to the Wikipedia and saying, okay, download the content of this, no. and then I click hide, and then it says, give me the page that doesn't have that box filled in, give me the page that does. It could work that way, that's how the web used to work, but it doesn't work that way anymore, okay? That's probably some JavaScript that just says, I actually download all the content, it just says don't show it until the user clicks on this button. When it notices that the user clicks on the button, then it will show you the content, okay? So that's just JavaScript that's, that's uh, doing this kind of functionality, okay? Now, let's say that JavaScript comes down and it doesn't come down over HTTPS. Okay, so I download Wikipedia's web page, it comes over HTTPS, but the JavaScript, it says go out and grab this JavaScript that's over HTTP. That means the adversary can change the JavaScript. Is that a big deal? Yes. Okay, why is that a big deal? Okay, so JavaScript is basically, for now, we'll, we'll deal with this much later in the course, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about JavaScript, but it's basically all powerful. Uh, for that website. It won't break out of your browser, it won't break out of that website, but if it wants to completely change what that website looks like and completely change it to another website, or if it wants to start redirecting you or pulling in other resources, it can do all of that, okay? Uh, so JavaScript is basically, if you get untrusted JavaScript into your page, then you can't trust that page anymore. Even if it's mixed in with content that you do trust, it can basically just overwrite uh, the content that you do trust and replace it with content that you don't trust, okay? Um, so if you get scripts that come down, so JavaScript's the most common. Uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, Flash was very common. Then the iPhone decided we're not gonna support Flash and then everyone, and then HTML5 came out. And so those two things basically killed it. Uh, there, there's other stuff like ActiveX, and uh, there's a bunch of weird stuff in this category. But um, anyways, all this types of stuff, mainly JavaScript, uh, they're all scripts, they're all client-side scripts. Uh, in this case, you should not trust it. It should not show you the lock, okay? I'll talk about exactly what browsers do in a second, okay? But this is um, what we call active content. Uh, so this is passive content. and this is active content. Another thing that comes down usually uh, with a website is, let's say Wikipedia wanna change, they don't like this font. And I don't mean they don't like the font that says team name and logo, they don't like that font for that header in all of the articles across all of Wikipedia. Do they have to go into every single article and change that font on every single page? No, what they'll do is they'll define a template, a style template for all of Wikipedia. This website will say, hey, go grab that style template. It's going to tell you what font headers are. And if they want to change it, they just change that one file and then it changes all of Wikipedia, okay? Uh, so that file is generally called uh, CSS. And CSS should be passive content because it just, um, it just is telling you like what fonts to use and like that kind of stuff. Uh, but it turns out that people kept adding more and more features to it. And so eventually it got to the point where you could start sort of running uh, arbitrary code even within CSS itself. So it, it became a lot less benign uh, than it was, was uh, originally thought to be uh, or originally envisioned because people keep, kept going more and more powerful uh, design tools uh, in CSS. So right now it's, it's basically you should just consider it active content. And so it's, it's not as powerful as JavaScript for sure, but uh, you, can't, you can't trust uh, a website that brings down uh, untrusted CSS, okay? 
So what, how does the browser uh, respond uh, to this? And so one of two things happens. Um, well, there's a couple things that happen. So in this case, you also notice that browsers will change over time. <coughs> okay, so you know if in the future you're watching these videos, uh, this might not be true anymore even now. There can also be differences between browsers. So different browsers might do things slightly different, okay? Um, so what happened in this case is, uh, first off, really early on, it would just show the lock. Okay, so that was sort of the, the first case. Uh, then what they did is they started showing you a special lock. So it was kind of like a lock with a cross through it or a red X through it. And if you hovered your mouse over it or clicked on it, it would tell you mixed content warning. Okay, mixed content means you have some active content that's being mixed between HTTP and HTTPS. Okay, so it's a secure, uh, insecure and secure mix of content. Um, so they would show you a mixed content error. And I think there's some browsers that still do that. So this is some browsers. Uh, then what Chrome did, um, so generally I'm, I, I'm a big fan of Chrome. I don't use it myself just because I like Safari because it syncs with all my devices and things like that. But um, from a security perspective, Google has a very good security team. And we'll see lots of examples, especially in the space of, of TLS, where uh, Chrome was kind of the first mover, uh, the first big browser to try out different features or different security improvements. Uh, so they really kind of pushed it. And then when Chrome does it and it works, uh, then it ends up being, then all the other browsers sort of copy it. And Chrome's in a really unique position because they have the number one most popular website, Google, and they have a very popular browser that's implemented on a lot of uh, laptops, and they have an extremely popular smartphone uh, that all runs on Chrome, right? And so even if they do some weird thing that only Google the website supports and Chrome their browser that's on all Android phones and maybe on your laptop, supports you still get a ton of traffic right there's a lot of that that makes up a huge chunk of of the internet traffic right and so if they can prove it in that use case and they control both ends of that tunnel uh then they can they can go out and and, and show that it actually works in the real world uh and then other other browsers will sort of catch on and other websites might catch on as well anyways on the browser side what they said is they just outright blocked especially for javascript uh but they ju they'll just block active content that is not over. HTTPS. OK, so if you have a website and you say, go fetch this JavaScript, they'll just block it. They won't. Chrome won't fetch it. What will that do to the website? It might break it, right? You, the website's expecting that you have some JavaScript component loaded. It's not actually loaded. And so then that functionality doesn't work on the website. And so eventually they just sort of got fed up with this and mixed content was like showing up. There, there was a period of time, I, you might remember it, where you saw mixed content everywhere, right? And so eventually they said, that's kind of like a scourge on the internet. So uh, let's, just, let's just block it. And yeah, we might break things, but then that's going to put pressure on uh, the developers of the website to start serving their JavaScript. Uh, over SSL, okay? And a lot of times they'll do that. They'll sort of say, as of this date, you know, a year from now, we're gonna make this change. And yeah, it's gonna break a lot of things if, if you're not following the best security practices. And then they hope that they have enough leverage that uh, websites actually change in response uh, to it because nobody wants, you know, your users don't wanna uh, go to a, a broken website, okay? Um, and so now I don't know, like for Safari, Internet Explorer, Firefox, I don't know where they are in this i know that chrome is down here and i don't know if the other ones are also down here now or if they're still up in this category um, but anyway these are the two kind of major responses to active content being served over uh, http not https Okay, so anyways, let's go back to the attack tree. So what does that mean for our attack tree? So what that means is that uh, if we recover passive partial traffic from external observation, that's why I renamed, you know, looking from outside the tunnel, uh, we learn the domain being visited. We also learn all 
uh, components, uh, all, we'll say all content of the website not over HTTPS, okay? If we can somehow get JavaScript um, onto the website. So another thing is if the developer points to our website, they're like, hey, go grab this JavaScript from Eve over there. She has a really good library for you know making websites look really pretty. Um, then what, it, what will happen is it will grab that, it will pull it, put it in the website, and now Eve's code is running on that website and it can basically, uh, it, first off, it could just read the website what's everything that's on the web page right now, and then it could phone home, it could open a connection to Eve server and just relay all that information over, okay? So if you can get active content onto a website, it doesn't matter that it was served over HTTPS, you can know everything that's on it. You could also open up a non-HTTPS connection. There's a lot of, you can use your imagination. There's a lot of things that you can do, basically once you own that, that end point of the tunnel. Um, so this is sort of like, we thought of like getting the tunnel pointed at you. In this case, you're kind of getting the other end of the tunnel pointed at you. If you get JavaScript on Alice's computer, um, or sorry, on her website that, that she's visiting, then it's, it's almost like you have this end of the tunnel pointed at you. And so all the, the content that comes out of this end of the tunnel, you can also relay it. So it's basically as powerful as having the other end of the tunnel pointed at you. Okay, now let's say that, um, okay, so we have these attacks, they're nice. Let's say we can't do any of this stuff. So I can't get JavaScript on it. Uh, the browser is just blocking outright all uh, non-HTTPS uh, web uh, contents, JavaScript, and stuff like that. Um, so now I'm just stuck on the outside. Uh, all I can do is I can see the domain that Alice goes to, right? Um, is there any other way that sh that I can learn as this adversary that Alice is looking at the Montreal Impact Wikipedia article? Assuming that all the content, like if I see that logo go over, then I might say, okay, that that I know what article she's looking at, okay? Uh, but we'll assume that all of this stuff is secure. So all the back and forth uh, between the, the between the user and the server, it's all over HTTPS. Okay. Is there anything else we can do here? Someone said something louder. No. Okay. So that's not what I'm thinking of. By the way, I forgot my charger and I'm about to run out of battery. Does anyone happen to have an Apple MagSafe? Otherwise, I'll have to switch to the board. It's like the old one too, not the, or the newish one. I see someone rummaging through their bag. Yeah, can you pass that? Oh, thank you. Everyone's like, I just let his laptop die so that <laughs> end class early. Okay, so this is not the right one, unfortunately. Sorry. Anyone else? I had 100%, so I was hoping that I could get through an entire class, but. When you end up recording the screen, it ends up taking a lot of battery. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, that sounds good. All right, crisis averted. Thank you. Um, you get an A plus. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's take a look at what, what is all this stuff that goes back and forth. So let's actually look at it first and then, and then we'll see if there, uh, there is another attack, uh, but let's see if we can sort of infer it. So if I want to see the kind of back and forth, in most browsers you can do, uh, if you right click and go inspect element, uh, what it will do is it will give you a kind of view of what does it actually look like 
uh, what does the composition of the website look like? You can see different things. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just refresh this. Okay, so you can see that the website coming down actually took some amount of time. So if you look up in this area here, I'll refresh it again. Now, things get cached, and so it's faster every time you refresh it, but this is basically a bunch of stuff that comes down. So it doesn't actually come down instantly, even with a modern uh, broadband connection. Okay. The next thing is that this is that first document that we talked about, that HTML document that links to all the images and things like that. Okay. Um, so that's there. Okay. Uh, what about all this other stuff? First off, it might shock you like there's a ton of stuff here, right? Like it's not like two pictures come down and the HTTP uh, page comes down. There's actually a whole bunch of, of different stuff that comes down uh, with this website. Okay. Um, and so you can see that there, there is a lot here. Uh, let me grab a little screenshot of this. So if I want to draw this out and add this stuff to the diagram, you know, there would be a lot of back and forth. Okay. Um, now Wikipedia is actually a very clean website. Uh, it's not like there's not a lot of third-party trackers and things like that in it. Uh, they serve all, all basically all their content from Wikipedia resources. It might be slightly different subdomains, but uh, if you take a close look, you can see. Okay, so these are the resources um, that come down here. Okay, uh, actually this is position well. Okay, so here are the resources, the content, if we will. These are the servers. So we're talking to n.wikipedia.org, we're also talking to upload.wikipedia.org, and then there might be some more that didn't fit in that screenshot. Um, but basically, we're just kind of talking to two servers, so that's not so bad. Uh, this is the type of content. Okay, uh, so we have some images. Style sheets are the, the CSS files. Um, and then we have JavaScript that comes down. Uh, so those are the main uh, categories of things. There might be other stuff, but I think on this website, it, it basically is just that type of thing. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, sorry. So these are active. So we require that they come over HTTPS. These images, we don't care uh, so much. It'd be nice if they came over HTTPS. And then it will tell us that actually, indeed, for Wikipedia, all their stuff comes over HTTPS. <coughs> okay. We use a GET request uh, to get them, uh, as opposed to JavaScript opening up. So JavaScript can also say, go grab a resource. It doesn't use a GET request. It uses a different request. Um, we'll talk about that more when we talk about uh, cross-site scripting. Um, but anyways, this is a simple website in that regard. Uh, status just means, yeah, we found the file, that kind of thing. Cache is saying, uh, because I refreshed that a couple times, it already had the images, so it didn't actually go out and ask Wikipedia for it. It just pulled them off my computer. Uh, we have the size of all the files, uh, the amount that was transferred. So the reason it's zero bytes is because it was cached, um, so that's fine. Uh, then there's the time. So the other thing is that there is a certain dependency. Like you might uh, go to a website and ask for JavaScript. You download the JavaScript. The JavaScript says go make a little iframe and put another HTML file in that iframe. And you can't get that HTML file until you run the JavaScript to realize that you need it. Okay. So you ask for the JavaScript. You get the JavaScript. It says get this HTML file. Then you get the HTML file. And then when you get the HTML file, it says I want you to go get an image. Okay, and they have to go in that order. It has to be JavaScript first, then HTML, then image, for example. Okay, so sometimes you can just pull it all down. Like you get the HTML file and it says go find these hundred images, right? You can do them in any order and you can do them all in parallel. In other cases, you have to get a resource to realize you need another resource, and then there's a certain sequence uh, that that happens. Okay, uh, so those are the two kind of traffic patterns uh, that you might see. Okay, so let's go back to HTTPS. Um, this here, first off, the, the name 
and also the content of this. If it comes over HTTPS, is this in the envelope? Is it actually protected by HTTPS? Does somebody who's on the wire, do they learn the names of these things and see the actual images, the actual scripts, and all of that type of stuff? No. no. OK. So this is hidden. Basically, everything that's here is hidden by HTTPS. What about the servers? OK, they're visible because you have to know where to go and ask for it. OK, so these are visible under HTTPS. The type of thing, so that goes along with the thing itself. So the name, the type, the actual content, uh, so that's also going to be hidden. The fact that it's a GET request happens to also be hidden. Um, this background is maybe a little confusing. Okay, so these these are the kinds of things that are are also hidden. Okay, the fact that you're using HTTPS is known. Okay, so you do see that connection that's formed. The kinds of errors, the status that comes back, that will be hidden as well. Um, this is all browser stuff. It doesn't matter. Um, what about this? This is like a meta information. About so it's meta information, absolutely. So it's a size. Does HTTPS hide the size of the image? So it hides the fact that it is an image. It hides the file name. It hides the data itself. Why does it hide the size? Okay, so what is HTTPS actually doing? How is it, how is it hiding things? So what it's doing is it's using encryption. Okay, so it's taking it, it's kind of scrambling it up. Okay, so here's a really basic question uh, that maybe you know the answer to depending on whether you took 6110 or not. Um, if I have a file and my file is 370 bytes, I encrypt my file. So the output of it is the scrambled up version, which is called the ciphertext. How big is the ciphertext? Depends on the cipher we're using. Okay, so let's say I'm using a basic cipher like AES in GCM mode. If you've taken 6110. If it's 256, okay. So for every single encryption that will be used in this context the output will be basically 370 bytes, okay? At most, it might round it up or down to the nearest 256 bits uh, because it's using something called a block cipher that encrypts things in blocks. If it's using a stream cipher, which SSL could, then it could actually be exactly the exact same number of bytes. Uh, but basically, just for the purposes of this class, we're going to gloss over the cryptographic details. Encrypted text is exactly the same length as non-encrypted text. Okay, so back to the question. Does HTTPS hide the length of the stuff that's being downloaded? It does not, okay? So it, it's visible under HTTPS. How many websites do you think, so Wikipedia has, I don't know how many articles. Uh, let's, they have millions of articles, probably. Okay, um, so if I'm if Alice is going and looking at Montreal Impact, I know she's reading some article on Wikipedia, but there's millions of articles, so I really have no idea what she's looking for, right, or what she's looking at. But let's say I do see the HTTP traffic, so I see she goes over to Wikipedia and says, "Give me an article," or I assume that's what she's doing. Why else would she be on Wikipedia? And then I look at the traffic, and it's really curious. I see that. Uh, the first thing is, I see like encrypted noisy data, but I see, you know, 49.44k come down, then I see 107k come down, then I see 4.9k come down, then I see 19.39k come down, 
and then I see, oh, she goes over to upload.wikipedia.org and there's something that's 370 bytes that comes down, something that's 412, something that's 258 bytes that comes down. I see that she downloads exactly 78 images. I see the exact sizes of all those images. How many of those million Wikipedia articles have exactly 78 images of those exact sizes? Probably none, right? It's probably only one. So do I know what article she's looking at? You bet. Exactly. So if I just look at the sizes of things, then what I can do is I can uh, sort of fingerprint what a web, what does the Wikipedia article look like in terms of the traffic it generates? And it has a kind of fingerprint where it goes and it fetches these files or it goes to this server and fetches this number of files and they all have this certain size. Okay. And so what that fingerprint looks like, it, it looks kind of like this if you want to visualize it. It's going to look different for all the different articles. Okay. And I already know that she's going to Wikipedia, right? So it's conceivable that I could, if I was really interested in knowing what article people were reading on Wikipedia, I could fingerprint all of Wikipedia, right? And then I could just stand at the outside of the tunnel. And even though, yes, I can't break into the tunnel, I can't figure out what is the information that's actually uh, being sent through the tunnel, even from the outside, just by looking at the packet lengths, the number of packets that are being sent, where they're coming from, how many servers are involved, I could actually probably do a very good job of inferring exactly what article she's looking at. Okay, And so it turns out that researchers have tried this and it, it's very successful. It's not 100% successful, but it's you know 80, 90% successful. It depends a lot on, on the different websites and things like that. So let's add a bit about this to the notes. Um, Okay, so websites that weave together all this content, you can look at how many resources is it loading, what are the sizes all, of all of them, what are the origin servers, and you can maybe get a unique fingerprint uh, for that particular website, depending on, and in this case, the more complicated the website is, it's almost better. Uh, if it's pulling a lot of different content uh, from, from different places, then it, it makes that fingerprint uh, look even more unique, okay? Um, Okay, so a few things about this. So first off, this is maybe a little surprising, right? You can actually uh, do a lot with HTTPS, but I also wanna make sure that we don't think that this attack is more powerful than it actually is. So to motivate that, think about, let's say I log into Gmail. So I have my inbox, okay? Uh, my inbox is coming to me over HTTPS, so all the emails and things like that. Could I use that fingerprinting attack? Could an adversary use that fingerprinting attack to, to know what my Gmail content is? Okay, so no seems like the right answer, but why? Like, what? How? What's different about it? Okay, 
So the point of this fingerprinting is before the adversary learned that I was going to Montreal Impact, they had to go to Montreal Impact themselves and see what the size of everything was, okay? The point of my inbox is the adversary can't first go to my inbox and see what the size of everything is to build that fingerprint and then compare when I actually go to my inbox, okay? So fingerprinting only works on public websites, okay? So websites that are on the public web where the adversary can go to it and you can go to it as well. So you're both looking at exactly the same thing. The only thing is HTTPS is, is sort of protecting what you're looking at when, okay? So if the adversary can reach the same website as you, they could fingerprint it and then they could pattern match that uh, to when you go and visit it, okay? Okay, so let me uh, add this to the tree. Okay, now there's one other thing, uh, one other attack. So first off, is there questions about this, this one? What if there's which? Yeah, okay, okay. So the fingerprinting isn't perfect. So there's a couple other things that could go wrong. Uh, so the first is, let's say you get some status error and then you have to go and ask for it twice. That's going to make the fingerprint noisy. So now you're getting the same resource twice. The other thing that happened here is notice that I actually had cached all these images. So an adversary wouldn't see those requests because uh, those are just coming off my computer as well. So these are the things that add noise to the fingerprint. And so fingerprint, that's that's another case where it's not reliable. Um, so if it's just a little bit, like a few of the things are cached and things like that, it is a kind of statistical model where we'll look at it and we'll say, that looks close enough to it that we're 80% sure that it's the same, but we're not 100% sure. So that's sort of how it works. It's kind of a statistical thing, but yeah. And if the website is like a new channel website, it is very dynamic in content. Mm -hmm. Even then, then also it's not very effective. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So if the website is constantly changing and things like that, then your fingerprints get stale and then you have nothing to compare to uh, as well. Yeah, so uh, that's another case where this is sort of weak. Okay, so it works really well for some things. Like Wikipedia is actually a, a tailor-picked example because that's where it really shines. But then, yeah, when you start pushing back on, on other things, and even if the content of the website is personalized to you because you're logged in or something like that, um, then, then that starts to break the fact that it's not like a public website anymore. It's kind of a personalized website. Um, so yeah, yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, there's one other thing that you can do. Um, Okay, I was hoping to just copy and paste the picture in. Um, unfortunately, my Google search will uh, give away what I'm looking for, but that's all right. Okay, so I wanted to show you a picture of a building that's in Utah. looks kind of like this. Of course, there's no actual picture here. Right. 
So Google Images makes it even harder. <coughs> Anyways, uh, we'll just screenshot it. Yeah, whatever. I give up. OK. So this building is another option. So what is this building? So you saw me type in NSA. What's the NSA? OK, so we're all in Canada, but we all somehow know what the NSA is. OK, so this is the government spy agency in the US. Canada has an equivalent uh, called CSE. Uh, all, most countries in the world have some sort of spy agency. Uh, this is a new data center that they're building in the Utah, or it's probably built at this point. Uh, no one knows what it's for, sort of classified. Uh, but lots of people have a, a very simple guess as to what it's for. And it, you know, as secretive as they are, you know, it, it's sort of kind of obvious to figure out. Uh, so what's this data center for? Basically what it's for is basically storing all information, all the traffic that they can uh, on the web, even if it's encrypted, especially if it's encrypted, okay? And why would they store encrypted traffic? So maybe it's that they can break encryption and nobody else can, and that's always a possibility. And uh, we have seen that they're ahead on some attacks uh, uh, as opposed to academics and things like that. But anyways, from my personal perspective, I don't think the NSA is actually that much further along in crypt analysis than the academic community. So I don't think that's why they're doing it. I think there's another reason why they're doing it. Because the encryption is um, it's the same. They encrypt the same thing today and or 10 years from now, it's going to come out the same output. And if they have the same output for the same thing, they can just miss and match it to the right content. OK, OK. So you, what you described is slightly different, but the, the one concept is absolutely correct, which is in 10 years from now, okay? It's a much simpler thing, which is maybe they can't break cryptography today, but in 10 years, they might be able to break it. Yeah, yeah sure, quantum computing uh, could be one thing. So it turns out that quantum computing isn't as big of a threat to HTTPS as it might sound. Uh, this is, tends to be encrypted with something called SSL. Uh, or sorry, it is encrypted with SSL. It tends to be encrypted with something called block ciphers. Quantum computing don't help you with uh, with uh, block ciphers. And if the key for the block cipher came through something called Diffie-Hellman, then it's not going to help you with that. If it came over RSA uh, key transport, then it will help you. So if all of that means nothing to you, that's perfectly fine. I'm not going to ask that on an exam, but, but anyways, for your information. Um, but it is conceivable that whether it's mathematical or quantum or whatever, that they might have attacks uh, in 10, 15 years. We do know that ciphers that were developed maybe 20 years ago, some of them that were developed maybe in the 10-year range are breakable today uh, because of breakthroughs in cryptography, okay? So another th attack that you can do is, it, even if you can't break into the tunnel, you can just store it, right? And then hope that one day you will be able to uh, break it. And it might still be relevant uh, whatever went through the tunnel, even if it's 10 years old, it might still be have some sort of relevance today. Um, so you can store it and hope to break it in the future. Right? And so even though we had a bunch of new attacks, cryptographic attacks, you can't kind of go in a time machine and go back to the web, right? And so that's the idea of here is it's sort of a time capsule of, of a bunch of different things. So once again, don't know if that's what they're doing for sure. If they're not doing that, they're really dumb, right? Like they should be doing that and th they gotta be doing that. Like, yeah, it's exactly what they should be doing if, if they're doing their job. Okay, so we're going to store it. Uh, and then we'll break it later. How do we break it later? Well, that's going to be up here in this first category. Uh, this is a whole sort of topic of its own that we're definitely not going to squeeze in 10 minutes. Um, so is there any final questions or observations? Uh, yeah. About the log behavior on the browser. So you said about the data policy is defined locally on the browser. Can you overwrite them? Uh, so there are a bunch of policies in your browser. You would have a hard time overriding it. So the browser does give you some interfaces in their system settings where you can tweak a few little things. Uh, if you want to really overwrite them, it, you basically rewrite the browser. And so that would be like a deep-seated kind of change. And so not so easy. Uh, if it's 
we'll talk about what the policies are. If it's like things like including or not including certificatories that you can do s sort of through the interface. Uh, but anyways, yeah, we'll go into those details. Other questions? All right, great. We'll see you next week.